Every time Rick Remender does a series, people say that it's his magnum opus, but with Deadly Class, they may be right. With hoof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and we're back with another video. Written by Rick Remender and illustrated by Wes Craig, the first issue of Deadly Class was published by Image Comics in January of 2014, with the 56th and final issue being released in October of 2022. Yeah, there's quite a few delays with this one, and Marcus Arguello has been handpicked to attend the King's Dominion School for the Deadly Arts. Going from being homeless on the streets to training to be an elite level assassin, he will learn the hard way that there's no friends here, and surviving will be the hardest homework task he's ever done. But what happens when this life is better than the one that he knew, and in such a shadowy world, is it ever truly possible to escape? We're jumping into the art section now and I'm going to do the majority of this as a voiceover because I've fallen quite ill. You could probably call me Ian with how much I've been Fleming. It's a little James Bond joke for you. I can't say that Wes Craig was a name I was familiar with before Deadly Class, but damn. He did a good job. It's so stylized that I can't even imagine how one of the big names from Marvel or DC could do this, or how that would even look. From the very first issue, Craig's line work tells you what the vibe is going to be. It's bold, dynamic, and a bit like that game Super Hot with its 2D aesthetic, but I feel that was a great choice with it being set in the 80s. A large amount of praise also has to go to the colouring, especially because it does so much whilst only using a few colours. I was so impressed as well with how it rotated its palette so that the right tone could be felt depending on the scene, and it used such vibrant primary primary colours to pop off the page. The thing is, I would describe Craig's line work as being simplistic, but I don't want that to be misconstrued as if I'm saying that it's lacking detail, as it was phenomenal with how many little touches he could add into a single panel, whilst also managing to keep the focus on what the main part of the scene is. Because of that, all of the action had oomph because it was so certain in what he wanted to show. Someone getting shot, stabbed, punched, or even just falling had real weight to it, and it could afford to be over the top with its execution because it wasn't going for a realistic look. However, it's it's not all the time that this style sticks a landing. For the most part, Craig is great at knowing how much detail is enough, but the later into the series it gets, there are a few examples of him lacking that finesse. Especially when it comes to the faces, there might be a panel where he tries to get away with just having two eyes, a nose, and a line for a mouth, and it misses out on some of those nuances that elevated it towards the beginning. Additionally, I may have really enjoyed this, but I can see it being a bit Marmite to look at. Especially if you haven't read a lot of non-Marvel or DC books before, then it could be too jarring or difficult to engage with, and I personally didn't have that issue, but I do think it's worth highlighting as that may be applicable to you. And yeah, this makes me feel a smidge hypocritical, but at the same time it proves that the proof is in the pudding, because the last book that I reviewed was The Dark Knight Strikes Again, where a lot of the praise that I'm giving to Wes Craig could also technically be applied to Frank Miller. 2D look, minimal line work, bold colouring, but Deadly Class is that example where everything comes together and it just works. So yeah, before anyone wants to accuse me of being a hypocrite, that's my explanation. Regardless though, Deadly Class was a blast, and having Craig stay on it throughout the whole series was a large part of that, because it meant that it was always consistent, and it could really get immersed into this world. Having it in this huge format also helped, especially in some of those pages where it's mostly taken up by narration. It's why I'd recommend picking up this series in these Lux editions, which you can get for a little bit less with the discount codes that we've got with the channel sponsor, Organic Price Books. They've got great packaging, fast shipping, and amazing customer services. And if you use code Woof Woof, you'll get two dollars off your order. And if you're ordering three or more books and you want them to be delivered together, make sure you use code Woof Woof, ship it together for five percent off your entire order. Don't worry, you can just copy and paste them from the description down below, and you can use these codes as many times as you like. We're jumping into the story section now, and whenever I've read a recommender series, I've always enjoyed them, but it just feels like there was something that was missing that was preventing it from being in the upper echelon of books for me. I had a great time when I reviewed Fear Agent, but I felt like it bogged itself down a little bit too much towards the end. Tokyo Ghost was enjoyable, but I felt like I didn't see enough of that world, and I was concerned it was going to be a similar story with Deadly Class, especially with how strong it started. And I thought with this running past 50 issues, maybe Remender was going to take it slow, since most of his other books really hit the ground running, but it's like he took that as some kind of challenge. By the end of issue 1, I felt connected enough with Mark the stakes at play in the direction that this wanted to go in, and if I'm honest, the momentum and the delivery of the big scenes and the quieter moments was handled amazingly. And in fact, I was surprised by how much I gravitated towards a lot of these characters, and not just because I had the same name as one of them. Trust me, you don't get that happening a lot unless it's to be used as a punchline. And sure, Marcus has his moments, like when his bowels betray him in the comic shop, and just how nihilistic and depressive he could be, but other than that, I found him a great protagonist to follow. There was that sense that he could be great in school if he wanted to be, but the distractions of finally being a regular teenager in society got the better of him. The one thing that did kind of annoy me though, was just how much validation he kept getting. There were a few friends that would call him out here and there, sure, but he rarely showed much regret for some of the things he did, or the opinions he had. And think back to when you were in high school, there's probably 
countless views and ideas that you had that you wish you could just go back in time and slap yourself for, but there isn't really any of that with Marcus, and I think it could have been an interesting piece of commentary had they included that. Now I'm not sure if it's pronounced say it or say it, but she was probably my favourite character, and I really wanted more of her in this story because there could be large portions where she was just in the background. Her style, motivation and backstory was all great, and there were very few scenes with her in it where she didn't steal the show. The best part is that they gave us nuggets of her character and pieces over time, so it was really paced well and it never felt like she was just thrown at you. But the same can't be said for other characters. When the second year starts, more new students are brought in, which, you know, makes sense. We becomes an exposition dump to the highest degree, to the point where I just wanted them to do a spin-off instead so it didn't clog down the main story as bad. In fact, around the halfway mark, the vast amount of the book was taking place as narration on the side of the page. Now don't get me wrong, I don't mind that books have words, I I've kind of come to expect it, but at a certain point it felt like having art on the page was an inconvenience for Remender, as he'd narrate us through the entirety of a character's life who we'd only known for a few issues. Maria was one of those characters I was 50-50 on, depending on what she was doing would determine if I liked her or wanted her written out. It was when her and Marcus were strong that I liked her because when they weren't, she was just a massive drag. Although the longer the book went on, the more I warmed to her, especially because I thought she wasn't going to be such a key player early on, and Remender did such a good job of showing her going through that process of becoming an adult. And she did make mistakes and have to apologise for them, she did have conflicting emotions, she wasn't really sure where her head was at in places. So even though I can't say she was my favourite character, she was definitely one of the more interesting ones. And you know what? This book did a great job of capturing that tone that I loved in The Walking Dead, that one where no one was ever truly safe. This book was littered with shocking moments and deaths that had been conditioned to think wouldn't mean anything, but besides probably two instances, they always did. And that gave character choices a real sense of consequence. I loved how Mar morally ambiguous these teenage assassins and their teachers were. In one issue they could do something awful, but in the next I'd feel sorry for them, and there aren't many books that balance that well. Although, that sense of consequence isn't without its problems. Again, it's mostly happening in the middle, as it felt like Remender did something big and shocking just for the sake of it, and almost derailed the entire book just to prove that he wasn't afraid of taking a risk. It's bold, sure, and I have to keep it a bit vague until we get into the spoiler section, but it's worth knowing that he tries to change gears a lot in this book, and it isn't always a smooth transition. But I keep going back to the characters, and I think that's because it was so varied in this book, and even if some felt like a caricature, they all brought something different to the table. Especially the sort of evil student group, they were very on the nose, but I loved the dynamic of their clique and how unstable it was, and that at any moment, one would betray the other if it meant that they could get a bit ahead. It was the perfect foil to Marcus and his more genuine alliance, even if they had their own fair share of betrayals. Also, I didn't dislike all of the additionals who entered the book partway through. Helmet and Petra are probably my favourites of the new crop, mostly because they felt like characters and not just exposition dumps, but also because it continued the book's more international scope. Which makes sense because Europe deserves some love as well. For example, if you like the sound of organic priced books, but you wish there was an EU equivalent that gave you free shipping and free gifts with every order, then the only place that you need to know is Comics Bugle. They've got super fast shipping and they've been a pleasure to work with, and if you use code woof woof, you'll get 3% off all items that aren't already in a sale. So if Helmet ever asked me for a recommendation on who he should get his comics from when he returns home, it would definitely be Comics Bugle. I could spend a while talking about the characters, but I think I've touched the main bases. And if I'm honest, the concept and hook really isn't important to the overall story. And that's honestly one of my biggest gripes with Deadly Class. It sold me on a concept that was barely in here. The school after the first hardcover is really just an afterthought and just the catalyst that brought all of these characters together. It. The classes looked interesting, but we never really got to see how they function long term. I wanted more time in that ecosystem before it became fragile and more just like a backdrop. Show me what was going on in the classes, like I'm a bit of a Harry Potter fan, I'm not really afraid to admit that, and some of my favourite scenes there are the ones where you're just sitting in the classes and you get to see exactly what they're taught. Yeah, you can tell I definitely got bullied in school, but going into deadly class for the school aspect of it is like watching Fight Club because you want to see who wins in a fight. When you get to its core, it's not really about that, which is fine, but you should know that if you want to read this. Fortunately though, there was still enough in here that I enjoyed that I wanted to continue with the story when I realised that the school was never really going to be the focus, but if you don't gravitate towards the characters, it may become a bit of a chore during some of the middle part. Another thing that I think could be a barrier and got under my skin after a while was just how juvenile some of the characters could be. Sure, there are a lot of teenagers in this, so I did give it some leeway, but you get to a certain stage and everyone introduced is just like, uh, and I'm going to have to throw like a viewer discretion as advised bit here. Hey, my 
my fucking pecker would fuck your fucking fucking pecker and your pecker will be my pecker then I'll be the big cunt with two peckers and you'll be the the, the sad fuck with no peckers and it's even the grown ass men that sound like that it's not just the kids and eventually it reads like the entire thing was written by an angsty teenager rather than just revolving around one although yeah I'm throwing a bit of shade at it but at least the storylines it juggled always kept me interested especially when the characters are thrown into the mix with real crime syndicates and get shown just how different the wider world is compared to what they were being taught in school. The stuff with the Vatos and the Yakuza were the real story highlights outside of the school and it made the world feel rich and lived in and gave a sense of realism to contrast some of those crazier elements. No matter how well they were doing in school or if they were on track to be valedictorian, there were bigger fish out there and this book having that really elevated it beyond just being a school drama. Then contrasting those antagonists with Master Lin was great because he was exactly like something out of a 70s movie and I'm here for it except that much like the school, he doesn't play as big of a role as I'd hoped, which I feel is a massive missed opportunity. There was a great duality with him that he had this school to run and students to train, but at the same time he had his own agenda and favourites, and that really could have carried the majority of this series. And look, I'm just going to talk generally about the ending, but I'm not going to go into specific plot points. If you want to know absolutely nothing, then skip to the final verdict now, but there is a time skip in this series, and it almost goes ahead too quick to the point where it felt like it needed a few more issues. However, I do love when a series gives me a complete story and I probably would have felt like something was lacking had it not been there. Even better than that, it checks in with pretty much all of the major characters who've been a part of Deadly Class. Not all of the characters get an ending that I was happy with, some do, but others, it's quite sad. But it was such a wide spectrum that it couldn't all end well. Then again, I can't talk more in depth about it without jumping into spoilers. This is your final spoiler warning, so if you don't want anything ruined, make sure you skip to the final verdict. So this fourth and final volume was definitely a ride. I think I lasted through it in two settings. It somehow felt like both an epilogue and also the natural conclusion for where this story was meant to go. Seeing Marcus much older and especially in the early issues when he was struggling to get by and was forced to dabble back into the assassination world was so bittersweet. Because had these chapters not been included, I could have assumed that he went against the school and then life just went smoothly for him. It might have been delusional wishful thinking but I could have done it. I did love the way he and Maria came back together and made it work even though I have no idea how anyone gets over seeing the person they love shagging someone against a tree. Then again, I don't think Marcus can judge. But to touch on what I said earlier, it felt like Marcus was still so self-righteous and had the same views as before and just happened to be right. It's just fortunate that Brandy continued to be such an evil person to give him this adversary to go up against that did kind of validate all of his opinions, but just wanted a moment where he realised that maybe younger him didn't know everything. And if I'm being honest, I really wanted him and Sayer to get together. I feel like that was the path they were going on from the first issue. And then Maria came in and she's this distressed action for him but eventually he would go back to say it and especially so because her story arc was so tragic and the fact that she had that moment where she could just leave with Marcus but didn't and it led to a death was just heartbreaking. She did kind of fulfill the prophecy that she'd set out to and righted the wrongs of her brother but it still just wasn't enough. I also liked how Willie's death sat with Marcus and a few of the other characters later on in their lives. I had a friend die just before the pandemic it's what pushed me to start this channel to take my mind off it but it's still hard to forget so I imagine for Marcus having to see him shot in front of him when he did just turn him back around, that image is constantly going to be there. He's going to wonder what life would be like if he wasn't taken so soon and it's a grim reality of the world that he was brought into. And even in the parts where he has distanced himself from being an assassin, those shadows are always going to remain. And it was another one of those aspects that felt very real in this surreal world. God, I didn't realise how many things I wanted to talk about with this series. I might even have to start a podcast and not just such a Miraquai one. But the last thing I'll touch on in this spoiler section is a bit of a negative because it's Marcus's fake out death during the second hardcover. I hated this part of the story and the majority of the issues that followed up until he returned and that's mostly because I can't support hate towards Marcus's or violence towards them but also because I knew there were only two outcomes. Either they had killed Marcus off and the other three hardcovers are going to follow Sayer or someone I didn't care about or this was a fake out and there'd be some weird explanation later on and it would all just be a waste of time. In this case it was the latter which is definitely the lesser of two evils. We just meant that whilst we were following Z and Quan, I was just checked out and waiting until Marcus came back into the picture. Now look, don't get me wrong, I appreciate it being bold and taking risks, but sometimes you can confidently dive into the wrong end of a pool. Although all in all, if that's the biggest blunder this series made, it should prove how strong the rest of the series was. This is my final verdict. An independent books often find themselves in the tricky situation of being damned if they do, 
and damned if they don't. I'll admit I'm guilty of having those standards, of always wanting them to take more risks, but then judging them too harshly if those risks don't pay off. But instead, I should just be appreciative of what a series like Deadly Class brings to the table. For over 50 issues, Remender and Craig gave us a rich, vibrant, and twisted world full of interesting characters, a deep history and gripping plot that takes so many twists and turns it's impossible to know what's coming next. It was one of the most exciting reads that I've had this year, but that's not without its hiccups. Some of the surprises don't land, a few of the best characters can disappear for entire story arcs and instead focus on characters that I just didn't care about, as well as the juvenile sense of humour becoming a bit grating in spots. But I feel bad criticising Deadly Class because it's clear from every single issue that there's so much passion and fun being had by everyone that's working on it, which is why the final product stands as one of the best series that Image has ever published. It was great when I checked it out years ago and even better now that I can see the full picture. But if I had to sum up Deadly Class in one sentence, Everyone should give this a try, it may not be your cup of tea, but if it is, it will really hit the spot. So that's the review, hopefully you've enjoyed it, thanks for putting up with me whilst I've been a bit under the weather, but until next time just make sure that you stay safe, and stay mad all you dogs, woof woof, see you the next video.